Welcome back to Arsenal and our tour of the Landsberg L60 or in Swedish service the SGRV M38. Continuing right on from where we left off, I'm now in the hatch. Uh, I, I guess it's more the TC's hatch than anything else because it is closer to him, although in the turret sides are doors that can be used for the TC or the gunner. The hatch, as I mentioned, is a very simple type to flip forward to help close it. They've given you this handy lever and you don't have to reach all the way forward to grab the top of the hatch. Now to secure it, there's a little point here, uh, a little external nub, which gets interfaced with by a little locking latch here. So that's it, let's see if I fit in an L60. Now the commander's position you would expect is uh, cramped and well, I'm going to call it confining rather than cramped because I don't actually have too much of a problem in here. Uh, the turret is traversed a little bit off to about the one o'clock position. I can tell this for two reasons. A, because I can see the hull and that way is front according to the hull. And secondly, they've put a turret clock on the inside with a little pointer to my right saying that the tank is about at the one o'clock position. And if you do have to put a turret clock in your vehicle, it's probably a lot simpler to do this than to do that uh, rotating ring with the shaft that the Germans went off and did. And uh, again, my position is it shouldn't be necessary anyway, because as I say, I'll look down, I can see the, I can see the whole walls. I can see the 37 millimeter ammunition stowage on the right hand side next to me. And uh, it's worth pointing out that the, the Swede seems to have done this rather complicated. There's a clip on one end uh, the aft end, the base of the 37, and the nose goes into a swivel mount. You uh, pull the, the base end of the round out and then you extract from the nose ring and that's how you get at the rounds. Now that isn't the ready rack. So when I came down, I was standing on a platform. The platform, which has a hole in it, by the way, so you can access the uh, turret lock, lifts up out of the way and this now allows us access to the 37 millimeter ready rounds. There are 35 of them stowed here and I would presume ordinarily it would be the TC that will be taking the rounds out of here and it looks like you've got to do this right-handed so take the rounds out of here, fling them forward with your fingertips. Speaking of uh, access, uh, something which I'm kind of looking for, the, there's a elevation control on the gunner's seat. I haven't found one on the TC seat. It, it is very tight. It's um, you got to be careful moving around. But consider this. I am sufficiently far down in this vehicle that I can close the hatch, not a problem. Further, I have to lift myself up in order to see out the various uh, periscopes. There's a couple of actual periscopes and then there's a couple of direct vision blocks with the metal shield covering them. And similar to the back there are two periscopes and one direct vision block. I am looking to raise my seat in a tank designed basically in 1935. That doesn't happen often so kudos to Landsverk for figuring out how to, how to make this happen. Behind them, uh, while I'm looking behind, the radio set. Huh. So the Swedes have radio sets in their tanks, which a couple of countries are starting to do, but the Swedes had them and all. The radio antenna, by the way, will fold, fold down if there's a little sign on the turret lid saying if you're going under something more than six meters high, lower the, tur uh, lower the antenna, it folds forward and it goes into a little rest on the left hand side of the turret. So we have radios in your tanks, you've got torsion bar suspension, you've got welded tanks, you've got multiple men in your turret, granted only two, but still beats some countries I can think of, France. And the Swedes are definitely getting onto something here. Additional stowage scattered around, and well that's basically it. Uh, I can tell you that the gun is a 37 millimeter Canon M38 STRV, I guess it means the tank mount, complete with multiple befores symbols. And it weighs 81 kilograms, apparently. The only thing I've got to worry about from the TC's position in terms of comfort really is just my legs, because the drive shaft for this vehicle 
is on the right hand side. Remember, the engine's on the right hand side. And it goes forward to the transmission on the right hand side. Makes sense. Uh, so it does mean that I have to be a little bit careful as the turret traverses to lift my legs out of the way and keep my feet. Uh, but that's the only inconvenience I can see here. So, so far so good Sweden. You're doing well. Let's see what the gunner seat is like. Alright, so life's pretty reasonable for the gunner as well. So I'm sitting on a cushioned seat. I have a backrest. I've got nothing interfacing with my feet, i.e. no power shaft. I do have a little bit of ammunition on the left hand side I might run into perhaps, but uh, it's not the worst all things considered. Now I'm to understand that the way it works is that once the TC has expended all his ready ammunition and the ammunition on the whole side that then the gunner will grab the rounds and pass them over the TC to start restowing everything. To his front, sight, and in fact really his only optic barring the emergency one forward it is a by 1.75 with a 40 degree field of vision and it comes with a mill triangle which is also your aiming point and with a graduated scale on the right for the cannon on the left for the machine gun it looks like the cannon goes down to 3400 meters the machine gun to 2000 also up at the top is a mill scale for lead so by use of the knob at the bottom you would set your range and then by use of the knob on the side you would set your lead if any i'll see if i can put an inset into uh, into this so you can see what this site looks like it, it's a very simple site but it works fine controls well further down you have selectors for the cannon on the right and the ksp the machine gun on the left and I'm going to assume that there is an electrical firing trigger somewhere, which is why we have these. Haven't found it yet, but I'm going to assume there is one. Traverse and elevation. Well, elevation is, as you can see, a toothed cog. Very light, I have to say. Maybe just a little bit breech heavy. And the traverse, again, is very light indeed. As uh, if you're wondering why that moved, the camera is actually mounted on the outside of the uh, turret. And uh, it's a testament to turret balance. If you are flat on level ground, even an unbalanced turret can be reasonably easy to turn. But this vehicle, as you saw, is on an upslope. And it is still easy to turn, so easy enough. Up, forward and left fire extinguisher. It's a manual type, so you have to grab it and pull it down. Uh, this cable here seems to indicate that the night, uh, there is an illumination in the optic for night shooting. To the right is the 8mm KSP machine gun. Now I'd said 6.5 up top. Apparently there was a changeover somewhere in the career. So 8mm here and there is a direct vision port to the straight front. I mean you can't really see very much out of it. I'm not quite sure how you are supposed to make use of it. But there is an iron sight still mounted on the machine gun that you can use to aim out. And in theory, if it's coaxially mounted, I don't see why you can't shoot the 37 with that back up either. This then brings us now over to the 37. And as I said, you have the electrical trigger, presumably. There are two fail safes. One is a knee pad that you, you kick your knee to the right, and you see the mechanical linkages coming all the way up to release the sear. Or the alternative and the TC can fire this one, is this lever here, you pull, pull down the plunger and you push it to the right, or from the TC's perspective, you pull it to the right. And that also will send around down range. The 37 millimeter is a reasonable gun. Uh, it's uh, per certainly good enough to take out pretty much anything that you're going to encounter, possible exception of a KVU or the French tanks. And Bear in mind, this vehicle only has 15 millimeters of armor. Not much, but in 1939, there wasn't much else that had much over two centimeters of armor either, uh, even three centimeters of armor. This 37 was quite capable of dealing with that sort of an opposition. Now, over later years, things get a bit more problematic, and indeed, they did invent a saber round, but that will only go so far. Spent shell casings when they're ejected. 
they hit this curved ramp, go down a chute, and are slid forward into the shell casing bag, which also collects the shell casings from the 8mm. It's fed from the left. Outside of that, the gutter isn't doing too badly. So he does have a hatch, again, of his own to the left. Uh, he has no other vision outside of this little vision block here. He can also play with the radio if he has a need to. And, well, the only other remaining thing then is to go forward into the driver's hole. Now, the museum director has bet me a cup of coffee that I will not be able to fit into the driver's hole. But I suspect I will. So I think the museum director owes me a cup of coffee because I can drive this. Now, to get in, it's uh, two ways. One is it can come in through the hatch, or the other is the backrest, clever people, uh, just uh, open a latch and it'll swing 90 degrees out of the way and I can just slide straight forward from the gunner seat. And better yet, the backrest is two positions and I'm in the forward position. Uh, now, it'll go back maybe two inches. I mean, it's not, not a huge move, but it helps. And the reason I haven't done it, though, is that in order to do this, I've got to get a spanner and unbolt the thing and then rebolt it back in. You know, Tom, I don't have right now uh, because this is actually a reshoot because I balls up the first time with the wrong kind of filter on my camera, which is why the outside parts of this might be looking a bit dark. I do fix this later. Anyway, uh, the drive shaft takes up a fair bit of where my feet would ordinarily go and you know, unfortunately my feet are perhaps a little bit big for proper use of the vehicle but I can do it. So the accelerator is a pedal on the right, the brake is where you would expect the brake to be and the clutch, well that's on the left and it's actually a pretty smooth clutch. The gear shift is a manual 5-speed, it's down here on the lower right with the gate being up here, it's a little bit unusual. Just forward of that is a speedometer, actually it's a multifunction gauge really, uh, speedometer, oil pressure, uh, gas level, uh, water temperature, uh, odometer reading. I don't see anything about RPM though, which is interesting, but I guess you're just going to have to work, like a lot of vehicles at the time actually, you have to work off ear. The vehicle will get up to about 28 kilometers an hour, which isn't too bad for its uh, eight tons in 1935. Now, I keep calling it a 1935 vehicle. It's really a 1939, but... Ignition down a little bit lower, and to the right is the actual gearbox itself. So you can see that there isn't actually very much linkage between where the gear shift is and where the actual transmission is. On the left-hand side, there's very little. Uh, direct vision port, periscope, direct vision port, periscope, periscope, and a, that looks like a direct vision port. The direct vision ports do have metal sheeting that can come down on the outside, but of course, frozen in place. Steering is conducted by use of the two tillers. Now, initially, when this vehicle was built, it had a steering wheel. I have I have no idea where they would have put the steering wheel, and it's not a small steering wheel either, it's about yay big. Um, but they seem to have deleted it, good call. And all the steering wheel did anyway was what the levers do. So they simply replaced it with these two levers and standard operating procedure for that. So the last thing to do, I guess, really at this point is to exit out of the vehicle. and. I'm not too sure I'm happy with the hatch on this. Uh, there is a lockdown on each side at the top, which I have open right now. And there is, uh, it's sort of strange. There's a hinge off on the pivot point. So it lifts up on one side a lot, on the other side a little bit. And then you kind of manhandle it around to get into the... Uh, to get into the the carriage position on, on the bar, on the support arm. But, uh, yeah, so good job, Sweden. You've shown how you can get three very tall people into a small tank in the mid-1930s. Right, onwards. Let's see if we can get out of here.
that's not the way you do it. Aha. You gotta watch your fingers. Okay, and if you go even further, there's a lock that you can put a safety interlock in and stops it from swinging back at the most inopportune time. So, not the fastest hatch to get out of, but you can get out reasonably quickly. So there we are, the M38. Now, I've been referring to it always as a 1935 vehicle because fundamentally it is. In fact, that's when the Irish got theirs, if I recall, with the 20 millimeter Madsen cannons from Denmark. But the M38 is so-called for a reason with the M38 gun, 1938 vehicle. So we're now looking equivalent to maybe some of the, uh, the A9 cruiser, the Panzer III is about coming out, the, uh, the Soviets have their T-35 with its three-man turret. These are all three-man turret vehicles. That's the one complaint you have about the M38 is a two-man turret. But other than that, fantastic design. And I hope you found it interesting and informative to tour. Big shout out again to the Patreons who helped fund this trip and create the video. And I'll see you on the next one. Doing this faster if my cables weren't connected. So it would appear that this backrest has two positions. So let's see if I can move it to the rear one. Come on. There we go. Ah, no, I can't because it's bolted down. Okay, well, this backrest has two positions.